So many times when I'm out there talking to students, uh, trainers in gyms all over the country and all over the world, one of the questions I'll get, maybe in the middle of a class, when I'm discussing that everything should be client defined and all these specifics uh, that, it that an individual might require and the concern over progression and the increments of progression and the many things you could progress in order to get to a specific adaptation. And sometimes people that I think are overwhelmed just raise their hand and they go, what, what, why are we worrying about all this? What we're doing now seems to work. And that's a really interesting statement. And the thing I have to ask you, by what measurement tools are you saying what we're doing now seems to work? Because I would suggest to you that's a very, very superficial, almost flat earth type of perception. Flat earth, you know what I mean? It's like, well, look, there's all the evidence you need. The earth looks flat. Just look on the horizon, look across the ocean. You get the analogy. Well, I'm going to give you another analogy. And sometimes I've found uh, as a teacher that students are not great with analogies. They immediately try to directly relate it. So I'm going to use the analogy of a hammer and a nail. And you might immediately go, I don't hammer no nails. In which case, I'm going to go, you are already one of those that doesn't understand analogies. So you might want to just go ahead and move on to something else on YouTube that's, well, like a lot of other things on YouTube. But this idea that, look, how do you measure the success if you were, if you were a carpenter and you were driving a nail and you had a hammer? Because what an awful lot of people do is just rear back. And let's say you got a nail this long, 16, they call it. You got a 16, it's a long nail, and it could go through two two by fours easily and stick out the other side a little bit, three and a half inches long. And you just hold it and you're gonna whack it as hard as you can because you're thinking the harder I hit it, the quicker I'm gonna get it in there. Right off the bat, you're gonna find, as an unskilled carpenter, that you might bend that nail. And if you do it with poor control and full force, you bend that nail almost irreparably. Meaning you've put a crease in the wood and you do that about twice and the nail may break off. So right off the bat is using the most force with exercise always the best way. I mean in the end we can progress up to doing some really, really tough stuff. But progression is the key and control. The quality of your swing, the quality of your attempt to stimulate the body is really important if you're going to progress up to more and more and more oomph, more force, bigger swing. And think about this, you think it's just the fact that the nail gets in there. So you're saying, Tom, I don't bend the nail to where it breaks. Eventually the nail gets in there. Let's say then from that point of view, it takes 40, tap, 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 tap. You back off to your current level of control. You reduce the force. Tap, 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 tap. Takes you 40 strikes, 40 attempts to get this nail in there. Okay. It's very likely that, uh, 15 of those you missed. 15 of your tap, tap, taps and you missed. What's the problem with that? Well, sometimes when you miss, you hit your finger. That has its own repercussions. So there's a risk, there's a cost benefit to even to your lack of control there and the learning curve associated with that. 10 of those times you could have still bent the nail that it just kind of went bent a little bit. It didn't bend all the way over like when you, when you went crazy with the hammer. So there's still 10 times that you had to stop and straighten this thing and each time you straighten it's never as straight as it was before. It's never as good as it was before as if you had more control even with those little tap tap taps. And then finally after bending it, after straightening it, after missing it, and some of the times you miss, this is one of the funny things, I actually put myself through college, building houses and, and one of the things I you know did was as a, a framing or a rough carpenter where you're putting up the, the part you see of the, as the walls, the, the two by fours. And it's really funny because the, the master guys, the guys who've been doing this their whole life, would make fun of us. If we had a whole bunch of hammer tracks in the wood around the nail, it's like, oh, what are you doing? You're hitting the wood more than you're hitting the nail. And it was a joke to them. So even though I got the nail in, it was a sloppy loser job to them like a rookie. So it's really funny. And that's just framing carpenter, rough end carpentry. If you're actually a finished carpenter and you're putting in really expensive oak, really expensive rosewood something for the trim inside of this house, and you miss that nail, and you hit that wood, that's expensive. That whole wood goes, that whole piece of wood goes away and they're bringing a new one in because nobody's paying for an expensive house with a bunch of hammer tracks all over their beautiful expensive woodwork. 
So there are repercussions to this thing. And my, what are we talking about here? We're still talking about exercise. We're still talking about how much of what we do in the gym is actually purposeful for driving that nail, for reaching this goal. How much of it is actually some version of, of cost or risk that we're just able to tolerate, just like straightening the nail out, but we're never quite the same as we were before. How much of it's just a waste of time? Think about this. The nail gets in. You go, yay, success. The master carpenter goes, hey, dude, you wasted so much money. It took you longer to drive that nail and fix your mistakes and mess up the wood. I could have done it in three swings and had that nail perfectly seated. And ultimately, that's part of how he measures the success of driving a nail, guys. What we do is we go tap, tap, tap. A perfectly driven nail, the head of the nail, is slightly in, flush with the top of the wood, without the wood being messed up. Because with that nail sticking out at all, it doesn't do the same job of holding the wood together. So I see nails all the time, metaphorical exercise nails, where the person never actually completed the thing. They kind of did conversational lifting, just kind of messing around, wasting their time, not focusing, and never really getting out of a, a workout what they could, as if they focused. I see people do a pretty darn good job, and in the 45 minutes for an hour, they're, they are, they're pretty solid in what they're doing, controlled right amount of, of progressed effort. But I see people also, there's occasionally this overzealous carpenter who after the nail gets seated keeps beating the crap out of it till it's a quarter of an inch down into the wood and the wood's all messed up and the nail's so far down in there that you can't see it anymore. That's a little excessive. Okay? How many times do we go in and beat the crap out of someone with exercise who's not yet prepared for it? And the repercussions for that individual become huge. And if nothing else, they simply learn that they don't like exercise because of that version of it. And that's a really, really crummy thing for them because they may not return to it. When a reasonable amount of exercise for them at their level of progression with their individual idiosyncrasies inside, structural variances and all those things, we could have allowed for them and created client-defined custom fit exercise and they'd still be around. Improving their health. Improving their health. So. One other analogy, if that was all lost on you because you're like, I don't know about nails and hammers and none of that made any sense, I couldn't even follow him. Here's a simple one for you. Let's go to a little kid in milk. You got a two-year-old. He's got a gallon of milk. Now, what's the measurement of success for, I got the milk in my cup, mommy, because he picks up the gallon and in the process of getting some of it in the cup, half of it goes on the floor. He ends up dropping the jug. The rest of it goes on the floor on the other side of the kitchen. But look, there's some milk in here. It's kind of the same thing. We are so happy with such low standards. What we think works very many times has created more harm than benefit in the long term. So all I'm saying is that as an exercise professional, there's a lot more to it than the superficial version of what seems to work.